Hey guys, another month has passed and what a month it has been. The world has gone from metaphorically on fire to literally on fire. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. Not only do we have three more months of this year, but years are an arbitrary concept and the calendar rolling over won't fix this mess. Fuck you, it's forever! Fuck you, it's forever! They're never gonna stop! But that doesn't mean it's all bad news. After all, video games still exist. <laughs> that makes it all worth it. Right? 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 Anyways, jokes aside, sorry for the lack of a proper video essay this month. I have all of the game footage recorded, but writing the script has been difficult. My original approach wasn't working, so I needed to restructure everything. Hopefully it'll be done soon. In the meantime, I'm happy to bring my monthly impressions video. This month had the Gamescom and PAX digital events, so I got to try several demos. I especially wanted to try the Lucifer Within Us demo, but technical difficulties with my computer kept me from running it. Remember, these aren't complete reviews, just quick impressions. That goes double for demos. I may expand on certain games later. I hope you enjoy the show! Tunic has been in development for a while. It was first shown off to the public in 2017. Despite the long development time, we haven't learned much about it. We've seen a beautiful cell shaded art style, a charming main character, a setting filled with ruins, and a gameplay design clearly influenced by Zelda. Now that we've gotten a public demo, we've learned a bit more. Aside from Zelda, there's an unsurprising Dark Souls influence. You have a stamina system tied to a dodge roll. You recover lost resources by returning to the site of your death. Combat feels tense and deliberate. While the main path's enemies were easy to handle, the game isn't afraid to throw difficulty spikes on the side paths. To me, the most interesting aspect of Tunic is its conlang, or constructed language. The majority of the text in the game is in a fictional alphabet with the exceptions being when the game has to directly state a button on your controller. Is it decodable? Will secrets or lore be hidden behind this text? Will it ask dedicated players to become amateur linguists and archaeologists? It might just be an aesthetic choice, but there's some interesting potential here. Weaving Ties Demo, developed by Follow the Feathers Weaving Tides is a game about sewing, and it's a lot more interesting than it sounds. The game takes place in a fantasy world made of interwoven fabric. It's inhabited by a civilization of moth people, cloth dragons called weavers who knit together the literal fabric of reality, and you, seemingly the world's only human. Together with your surrogate father, an elderly weaver named Kelim, you go on a journey to save the world from a creeping darkness and discover your past. The game feels satisfying in the same way that actual yarn work feels satisfying. You're constantly diving in and out of the webbing of the world, making patterns with your cloth tail. There's an immediate and easily understood physicality to the mechanics. It's a simple system, but the game gives it several uses. You weave back and forth to repair rips in the ground, you fly over enemies to tie them to the ground. You solve puzzles by creating patterns between set points. You dive beneath the surface to find hidden areas. It's all fun and good, but sometimes it feels like the enemies and puzzles just get in the way of the simple joy of playing with string. And already, hopefully, you can see that this is just fabulous stuff to play with. It might seem stupid playing with string, but it's not. Um. That's why I'm really glad that the Playgrounds mode exists. It's an empty expanse where you can weave whatever patterns you want, with multiple kinds of cloth to choose from. It has a built-in system for saving your own patterns and sharing them with other players. The game leaves plenty of room for self-expression, and I'm interested to see what skilled players produce. If I have a complaint, it's about linearity. Like Tunic, 
Weaving Tides has a clear Zelda influence. You collect heart pieces to extend your health bar, and the game moves from friendly town to dangerous wildlife to puzzle dungeon. But unlike Zelda, the world you explore feels small and constraining. But considering that this is a demo showing off the earliest parts of the game, the final world might feel larger. Also, the archaeologist dragon looks kind of like Joseph Joestar. Oh, nice. The Shattering Demo, developed by Super Sexy Software. Despite the enigmatic imagery, the premise behind the Shattering is actually pretty simple. You play as a man who's suffering from brain damage and memory loss after an accident. Your psychologist places you under an experimental form of hypnosis, guiding you through the shattered dreamscape of your subconscious. You explore and begin to rebuild your memories, trying to solve the mystery of your past. The demo was short, so I can't make any judgments on the story. Right now the only thing I could comfortably judge is the world and how you explore it. The world design is both a major strength and a major weakness. Its low detail monochrome look is striking. It really sells the impression that these places are half forgotten memories. Objects and details materialize as you explore and remember. It's both a novel narrative device and an interesting visual motif. But, at least for me, the fun of a walking sim is exploring a well realized place. The world of the Shattering is, by design, not fully realized. The core premise involves places that don't feel real and are lacking in detail. Your character doesn't remember and is trying to fill in the blanks. This isn't only an aesthetic complaint. The low detail environments means that exploring has two outcomes. Either the thing you're supposed to interact with is obvious from a distance and you just make a beeline there, or it blends into the background, and you're pacing while looking for the next progression flag. These aren't debilitating problems if the narrative behind them is compelling enough. And I'm not saying the Shattering's narrative isn't. I honestly don't know. The demo ends too early, without a strong plot hook. I wishlisted the game on Steam. I can see clear potential, but I'm not in a rush to buy it right now. First published in 1997, this cult classic only just got an English translation and release 23 years later. Moon sells itself as an anti-RPG. You play as a boy who's been sucked into the fantasy world of his newest video game, also called Moon. But here, you're not the hero. The hero is a bully who spends his time attacking anything he considers a monster and mindlessly robbing people's houses. Everyone relies on him, but no one actually likes him. You play as a bystander, a powerless child. Your character is invisible because he has no role in the story. You're not supposed to be here. If you want to head home, you have to save the souls of the animals the hero has killed clean up the damage left in his wake, and gather love from the world's inhabitants. Today, games that question RPG tropes and the hero's role are commonplace. Undertale, Under Hero, Wandersong, Contact, Okage, Hell, it's the entire oeuvre of the enigmatic Gyoko Taro with his Drakengard and Nier series. <laughs> ニアってゲームを作ったんですけれど、あの、その頃にはまあ窮地地とかイラク戦争とか経て、まあどんどん世の中があのテロとかの情報がいっぱい日本にも入ってきて、で、その時ちょっと考えが変わりまして、あの人
so it's exciting to finally have a chance to play this historically important game. If I had to describe Moon in one word, it would be clever. You start the game from the hero's point of view, and experience the entire story as a standard RPG. You then play through the same story again as the boy, seeing the same events from a different perspective. It doubles as puzzle hints and foreshadowing. That's clever. The game not only has a day-night cycle, but a week cycle. Everyone does different things on different days at different times. You get to know people by learning their schedules. That's clever. Different types of characters are represented by different art styles. You can tell them apart at a glance. People you can talk to are drawn in pixel art. Animals you have to save are made using claymation. Americans are in 3D rendering. That's clever. But clever doesn't necessarily mean smart. The game has no combat, but it has health in the form of energy. If you stay out for too long without going to bed, you collapse, and it's game over. Your energy bar increases as you help others, so eventually this isn't really an issue, but it still feels like an arbitrary limit. The puzzles are all over the place. Some are very clever, like having to decipher a fictional language. But other puzzles don't actually involve solving a problem, just waiting in the right place in the right time. Don't get me wrong, it's a fascinating game with a charming world and characters. If someone is interested in RPG history, then this game is a must-play. But it's an old, experimental PS1 game, and not all parts aged well. Just make sure to enter with the right mindset. Paradise Killer, developed by Kaizen Gameworks. There's an idiom that I read ages ago, one that I'm probably paraphrasing. No matter how hard I google, I can't find the source. Investigation is 90% legwork. The core of investigative work isn't the eureka moment, where a genius detective gathers the suspects and announces the truth. It's combing relevant scenes for evidence, which leads to interviewing relevant people, which leads to finding more evidence, which leads to more interviews. It's the hard work of information gathering. Paradise Killer lives up to this idiom. You play as the investigation freak, Lady Love Dies, an immortal woman born to solve mysteries. Your task was solving a mass murder on the island of Paradise, an artificial island made of psychic energy created by cultists to resurrect dead alien gods. You're given an expansive world to explore, and you'll be crisscrossing it plenty of times during your investigation. But it feels far from drudgery. The island is dense, both with landmarks and with information. You're constantly learning. Learning about an extremely complex murder mystery. Learning about the paths and relationships of the suspects. Learning about the everyday lives of the citizens of the island. And learning about a bizarre alternate history where human civilization developed alongside Lovecraftian horrors from beyond the stars. You're given plenty to think about between each discovery. My understanding of the case, the characters, and the world was repeatedly flipped on its head. I felt compelled to keep playing, and whenever I wasn't, I was still thinking over the mystery. The game actively encourages this obsessiveness. Unlike most mystery games, Paradise Killer won't correct you if you make a mistake or misinformation. The truth is not guaranteed. You can end the game with missing answers or accusing the wrong culprit. You and only you are responsible for finding all the information, making the right deductions, and checking your work. It's not completely unforgiving. You can find an upgrade that reveals hidden items, and your computer keeps track of collected evidence and open leads. But there are edge cases that both systems don't cover. The game still asks for due diligence. I can imagine that some people might find this game stressful or tedious, but if you're someone who loves mysteries, or someone who loves scouring every inch of a map, Paradise Killer was made for you.
Tebby Chang is an artist and animator. For many, he's most known for helping Toby Fox in creating the international mega-hit, Undertale. She was also the namesake of the very eloquent Temmies. Her creative career neither started nor ended with Undertale, and lately she's been experimenting with directing her own games. Dweller's Empty Path is her second game, a sequel to last year's Escaped Chasm. Both games are pretty simple. In Temi's own words, there isn't a lot you can do besides walking around and talking to NPCs and examining objects. But they're still really interesting. Partially because of the universe she's been building through multiple games, animations, and an upcoming comic, and partially because we're watching someone visibly grow as a developer in real time. Escaped Chasm was a game about a lonely girl dreaming of an alternate fantasy universe as reality crumbled around her. It implied a much larger multiverse, but only featured a single house with a few rooms. Its gameplay loop was just wake up, explore, sleep, repeat. Dweller's Empty Path is much more ambitious. It's a fully populated world, with multiple towns, buildings, a sprawling forest, and even some dungeons. There are multiple quests and dozens of optional scenes. The improvements aren't just in scale. Escaped Chasm had beautiful animation, but they were movie files accessed outside of the game. Here, the animations are much more limited, but they're all done in-engine. The transition from gameplay to cutscene is much smoother. She also added a hint system that checks your progress and tells you where to go next. While the game looks simple, it's an order of magnitude more complex than her first game. As a learning experience, this is a leaps and bounds improvement. But as a standalone project, it feels unfocused. Escape Chasm was created to set up a future story, but it still had a complete arc. The lonely girl wants to find her missing parents and figure out what's going on. She discovers the answers to those questions and makes an important decision. Dweller's Empty Path lacks this arc. Our protagonist, Yoki, is beset by nightmares due to the local asshole wizard. She goes on a walk to clear her head. You learn a lot of lore, meet plenty of fun characters, and get foreshadowing for future conflicts. But not much actually happens in the present, just a lot of tune in next time. This feels like an unfair criticism. The game is aiming to be another prologue. It wants to make the player familiar with the setting and make them interested in future installments. But the vague narrative creates a gameplay issue. The plot is just Yoki putzes around on her day off. Because she's directionless, the player feels directionless. This isn't inherently a bad thing. There have been plenty of games that make directionless exploration work. Just look at Yume Nikki. But in that type of game, there's often some sense of mystery and subtle clues that drive the player forward. In my initial playthrough, I kept relying on the hint birds to find the next scene. I'm excited to see how this story progresses, and to see how Temi grows as a developer. I just hope her future games are a bit more goal-driven, and give players a bit more direction. To the moon, developed by Freebird Games. Playing Moon and To the Moon together on the same month was a really good idea. I'm sure that it won't cause a million retakes as I mix up the titles. I should have tried Against the Moon this month as well, and covered the whole trilogy. I admit. I was going into To The Moon with some negative preconceptions. I had read criticism well before trying it. It's a decade old indie game, successful enough that it's getting an animated film adaptation. If you're deep into the indie game space, you're bound to hear something. But despite my preconceptions, I was pleasantly surprised. For the most part. The game takes place in the near future. You play as two doctors from a company known as the Sigmund Corporation. They offer a very specific service. When someone is on their deathbed, they can dive into the client's mind and alter their memories. They allow a second chance to fulfill a neglected wish, at least in their mind, and die without regrets. 
The latest patient, Johnny Wiles, has a simple wish, one he himself doesn't fully understand but feels compelled to complete. He wants to go to the moon. Thus begins a journey backwards through time, jumping from recent memories to childhood. You watch a man's life unravel in reverse and attempt to change it for the better. The game is light on actual mechanics. Once inside of one of Johnny's memories, you watch what happened to him and then search the scene for a memento to bridge you to a previous memory. Once you find said memento, you complete a simple block puzzle and are teleported further into the past. The mechanics are only really there to facilitate the story. Still, it's an interesting setup. Like I mentioned when talking about Cinemora, there's something fascinating about exploring the same space through different time periods. The Memento Hunt gives players plenty of impetus to explore and creates connective tissue throughout the story. It doesn't feel fully utilized. The pixel backgrounds are small and low detail, so the search feels limited. But it's a great scaffolding to build a story on. It creates a novel form of foreshadowing, where you see people facing consequences first and see their actions second. Things get really interesting when the tech inevitably starts going wrong, as is expected for this sort of sci-fi, and the music was fantastic the whole way through. As for the story, the story was good, until it wasn't, and then it was kind of infuriating. I'm going to be vague due to spoilers, but if someone is interested in going in completely blind, skip to here. Despite the title, the game isn't actually about space travel. The core of the story is the lifelong relationship between Johnny and his late wife, River. River was autistic and grew up isolated from others. Despite Johnny not understanding her condition, they both fell in love. But it's that same lack of understanding that eventually caused a painful rift in their relationship. He couldn't mend it before her death. I was expecting the narrative to be about helping Johnny understand her, a bittersweet realization too late. But, to play it vague, they sidestep that entirely. They don't mend the rift, they make it so the rift never happened. River is never understood. Her feelings don't matter. Johnny's feelings matter. Maybe that was the only way this story could end. It's not about changing the past, but changing memories. No matter what, he still died unheard. Her corpse is rotting underground either way. But the way it was presented left a bitter taste in my mouth. The game has two sequels, Finding Paradise and the upcoming Imposter Factory. From what little I've seen, these games cover more of how this technology can be misused. Maybe my misgivings are addressed, but I am hesitant. Button City is a game about childhood and video games. You play as a young boy named Fennel and his friends, who collectively call themselves the Fluff Squad. You explore a world that feels like it's made of toy playsets. Each area is made of large, colorful props and split into distinct, open dioramas. The most important of these areas is the titular Button City, an arcade the kids frequent. The main game is going to be, in the dev's own words, a hijink story to save the arcade from a greedy fat cat who threatens to tear it down. A classic save the rec center story. The demo has its own story, with lower stakes. Today is kids day, and Button City's letting all kids play for free. The most popular game is the team based robot fighter, Gobobots. But the game is being dominated by a team of older kids on an endless winning streak. Fennel decides to recruit his own team and take them on. The recruitment stage of the demo is really charming. The writers really have a sense of a child's outlook and skewed priorities, but presents it in a way that doesn't feel belittling. Winning an arcade game feels like the most important thing in the world, and the player is swept up in that drama. There are moments that feel legitimately funny, like the kid making rambling conspiracy theories about nanobots and soda after watching horror stories online. The problem comes from the actual Gobobots game. It 
feels kind of boring. Not in that it's too easy. This is the starting demo for a lighthearted comedy game after all. It's just that there's not much to do. Your movement feels slow, your hits feel weak, and since you're only one of four, you don't feel in control of the match. If this is only one of several minigames, that's fine. I'm not here for those. I'm here for the bright world and fun interactions. But the Gobabot Grand Prix trophy in the background of the arcade makes me think this will be a recurring bit. If so, I hope that the full game adds more mechanics, like bot customization, to make it more engaging. Boom! Aha! How old is this game for? Six plus. Are six year olds children? Yes. Are we being overly critical of a game designed for kids? Maybe? Prince, this isn't a game, it's just juice. Give me pizza! The Magister Demo, developed by Nurture Productions. The Magister is a combination murder mystery and RPG. You play as the titular Magister, an investigator and peacekeeper for a fantasy empire. You're called to the backwater town of Silverhurst, only recently conquered by the Empire, to investigate the death of another Magister. Games like Persona 4 and Disco Elysium have proven that mysteries and RPGs can go well together, but I was hesitant about the Magister. The game's mystery is procedurally generated. There's a different culprit and different evidence each playthrough. I understand the reasoning. RPGs are designed with multiple playthroughs in mind. Changing culprits keeps repeat runs interesting. But a really good murder mystery requires distinct character writing and subtle clue placement. I was worried that random generation couldn't deliver the same effect. No one is really shocked by a game of Clue after all. The demo ended before I could really solve anything, but my fears were somewhat allayed. The mystery it generated seems a bit more complex than Colonel Mustard in the parlor with a pipe. In my run, the victim had been bludgeoned to death, but poisoned food was found in his room, meaning there were two separate attempts on his life. The issue is in how the game doles out information. Every suspect has some information on the case, but they won't share it until you earn their trust. You do this by completing side quests or doing business with them. If you're someone who's equally interested in the RPG and mystery sides of the game, then this is no problem. But if you're here primarily for the mystery, then the RPG quests feel like a layer of busywork. That isn't to say that the RPG mechanics are mindless. The game has two combat systems. One for physical combat, and one for verbal arguments. Both of them are based on Slay the Spire style deck building. The physical combat system is about preparation. You set all cards and strategies before the fight starts. The argument system is about improvisation. Your starting deck is minimal, and you buy extra cards every turn. It's a neat contrast, although I didn't get deep enough to master either system. I'm not sure how they hold up in the long run. That's my experience with the demo as a whole. All of its parts have potential, this game seems really interesting, but whether that potential will be fulfilled is still up in the air. It's time for this month's surprise hit, Among Us. In Among Us, you play as a group of color-coded astronauts, maintaining a damaged ship by completing various minigames. But among you are imposters, false crew members whose goal is to sabotage repairs and kill the crew. The crew wins by fully repairing the ship or discovering all imposters. The imposters win if everyone else is dead. In other words, it's Space Station 13, but playable by actual humans. Note that I'm not very experienced in this game. My first set of games were with a group where half of us, including me, had never played. 
The rest were done with randos in public lobbies. I might be embarrassing myself more than usual. When Among Us works, it works well. It's a fun combination of social deduction, stealth, and strategy. When it doesn't work, the game feels random. Sometimes the imposter is found not by skilled social deduction, but because they made an obvious mistake or random chance. Sometimes the imposters get a lucky kill streak before anyone can find a body and vote someone off. This isn't a huge problem because the rounds rarely last too long. If one round goes badly, the next is right around the corner. But that feels like both a pro and a con. In my experience, the best hidden role games are ones that give you plenty of time to deliberate and stew in suspicion. A slower pace encourages more thoughtful play from all players. The informed minority has more room to play cautiously, while the uninformed majority gets more information for deduction. In Among Us, the imposter feels rushed, and the crewmates are often working with wild finger pointing or vague guesswork. This isn't inherently a bad thing. It's a cheap game that's fast to learn and fast to play, with an active player base. There's still a good layer of strategy from imposters using sabotages, like cutting the lights, and the crewmates reacting to them. There's still room to bluff with false accusations and alerting people to your own kills. Even when it comes down to a gamble, gambling is fun. Despite my complaints, I still enjoy it. It's perfect for people who want a quick, low investment dose of subterfuge and suspense. And maybe my complaints are absent in high level games. There's room for both the 10 minute rounds of One Night Ultimate Werewolf and the hour plus rounds of Blood on the Clock Tower. But I'm also interested in more complex versions of the same concept. Maybe I'll try Unfortunate Spacemen, or Project Winter. Or maybe, I'll discard my humanity. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, developed by Vicarious Visions. That's right, it's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater back in prime form, before we all got dragged into Tony Hawk's existential nightmare. We can all pretend it's 1999 again, and nothing bad is happening. Honestly, it was kind of hard getting back into this game at first. The last Tony Hawk game I played seriously was Tony Hawk's Underground, and then I fell in love with EA's more grounded Skate series. It took a bit to readjust to Tony Hawk's more arcadey mechanics. Until I got the hang of stringing moves together, it felt kind of stiff. When I did get a hang of it, I was surprised at how small the maps felt. I remembered them being larger. But that was always the point, wasn't it? Yes, the maps in classic Tony Hawk are small, but each run is only two minutes long. You have to do as much as you can with what little you're given. The mechanics only feel stiff when you're falling on your face, and they feel smooth when you master it. The series lost its way when it forgot these principles. Revisiting Tony Hawk 1 and 2 was both nostalgic and a bit melancholic. I got to see firsthand where my tastes have changed and where they stayed the same. The more I play it, the more I love it, but it feels like something is missing. It might be some layer of mechanical depth, or it might just be the security of childhood. It's still cool as hell though. Part of me is sad that the game lost some of its grit. The user interface is clean and crisp instead of the PS1's dirtier look. When a skater crashes, instead of struggling to their feet, they teleport to standing with a weird glitch effect. It's smoother, but it undersells how these are bodies slamming into concrete at high speeds. And of course, as publicized by Brian David Gilbert, they took the punji pit out of the stage maker. 
A few years back, I was talking to my roommate about how we would fortify our apartment in the event of a Home Alone scenario, and I made some offhand joke about a punji pit. And he said, oh yeah, like in Tony Hawk. And I said, and also the Vietnam War. And he replied, the Vietnam War? But considering the amount of fun I was having playing endless rounds of horse and graffiti again, it's not a huge trade-off. So how was September for you all? Play anything interesting recently? Curious about any of the games I listed here? Want me to expand on any of them? Interested in any upcoming games next month? Tell us in the comments below. Please like and subscribe to fill the aching void in my heart. This is Else If Games, signing off.